Hello, I'm Sean Powers, and I am here to help you learn everything, do what you love, and most importantly, be kind. I'm here in my green shirt today, along with my friend, Funky here, who was actually not one of the original Pac-Man ghosts. He was introduced in Pac-Mania, and Funky is his name. Anyway, today uh, is a lot of talking head video. There's not a lot of demo. I'm going to show you some stuff on the command line, but it's going to be just a lot of me saying things about Linux. I will try to make it a little bit more exciting with jump cuts, but I'm not a terribly exciting guy, so we'll just jump right into it and see what happens. Now, this, of course, is part of the Linux Plus training. This will be good information even if you're not trying to get the Linux Plus certification from CompTIA, but in this video, we're going to specifically cover devices as they appear uh, in the Linux dev file system. We're going to look at what block devices are, character devices, some special character devices, and then I just want to show you some tools to look at the hardware in your particular computer. All right, but first of all, let's talk about block devices and character devices. Now, they're very, very similar in what they do. They are a way to get uh, data in and out of your Linux system. It's how your Linux system communicates with things like a hard drive, which is a block device, or a serial port, which is a character device. And the way that you can tell the difference between them is basically a block device uses buffers and caches to make the transfer of large amounts of data much smoother. Think writing a huge block of data to a hard drive. That's a block device. And any file storage devices are going to be block devices. The, the data is uh, put into blocks and you know usually cached and buffered so it's smooth, but writes huge chunks of data at one time. Whereas a character device is literally one character at a time. I don't mean a character like, like Funky over there, but characters like uh, letters or, or numbers or any character, and it's just a string. It's like, think about drinking from a fire hose. That's what a character device is. And there are some advantages and disadvantages to both. And so that's why they both exist. A character device is basically, like I said, a fire hose, a stream of data, and it's either going in or out. It can be bi-directional, uh, but there's no buffering involved, right? There's, it's, it's real time, as real time as you can get in a non-real time kernel. That's another whole video. Uh, but we're basically talking about a stream that isn't buffered. It's just like, as soon as you, the data comes, you get it, right? So back and forth very, very quickly. Um, it can be less efficient because of that fire hose thing, uh, as opposed to like a large block and writing it. But the difference between character and block is, I guess if I had to say it in one sentence, which I clearly don't feel the need to, because I've said it in like 27 sentences, is, um, the buffering or the not buffering, you know, the data when it's going in, if it's buffered or not buffered, character devices are not buffered. It's just like a raw feed directly uh, to and from whatever device it might be. So let me show you where devices live on our system. And then we'll talk about a few specific kinds. Now you might remember from one of our previous videos that the devices are going to be created in the dev directory of your file system. And again, this, these are devices. These are not actual files, but in Linux, everything is a file. So I guess maybe they are files. Anyway, uh, we're going to look at a few of these and I'm just going to describe them quickly. Like SDA, uh, SDA is the, the SATA drive and this is a virtual machine, but it's a virtual SATA drive. And then these are the individual partitions, SDA one, SDA two, SDA three, your system might have like NVMe drives in here. There's also going to be character devices. You remember we just talked about something like dev PPP is going to be, a uh, character device. And you can tell without guessing like I'm doing here by doing LS minus L because they will show up and the first character is either a C for character or if we, let's look for a block device up here, SDA is going to be a block device. So it starts with a B. You can tell what kind of device they are. And I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't mean a whole lot as far as um, what type they are, but it's important to know what they are, especially for the exam and know what the difference is. But hard drives are always going to be block devices and, uh, you know, like serial ports and printer ports are all going to be character devices. They just kind of like shoot the data. Uh, it, there's not a lot of buffering that takes place or not any buffering at the character device level that takes place. And so there are two, I think two, yes, two specific types uh, that we are two specific character devices that are mentioned. And I also want to look at one is dev zero. So this one right here, dev zero, it's a character device. And the other one is dev null, which if I know my alphabet, dev null, those are both character devices. And they're two character devices that they're kind of like virtual devices, right? And 
they're very unique and used a lot, it's important to understand the difference. So Dev Zero is a character device that just when you uh, query it or when you get data from it, it's just a constant stream of null characters. Now, that's not the same as dev null, and that's where it gets a little bit confusing. A null character is a binary zero. It's not the ASCII zero. It's not like the number zero over and over and over. It's a null character, which is a little confusing, I know, but it's basically, uh, it just sends out a stream of null characters. That's what dev zero does. Dev null, again, I know confusion, uh, dev null is kind of like a black hole. Uh, a lot of times it's referred to as a bit bucket. And basically it's a write only file system. You can put anything you want into dev null and it will never ever let anything come out. Nothing ever comes out of dev null. If you cat it, you know, like if you cat dev null, nothing comes out because it's a write only character device. You can only put things in, nothing ever comes out. And a lot of times we use that like to redirect um, standard output or standard error. We'll just redirect it to dev null so that it just goes away. If we don't care what the message is, we can just redirect it to dev null and it goes away forever. Uh, dev zero, we often use when we're zeroing out like a hard drive. You know, we want to write over all of the data. We don't write ASCII zeros when we zero it out. What we write on there is a bunch of null characters. And that's the difference between a null character and dev null. Hopefully that's clear. I wanna show you really quick what happens if you try to create a file so it kind of cements it a little bit more. So I'm going to just go to the I'm root user because we'll need that in a little while, but uh, in this folder, uh, well, there's a folder called snap. But anyway, we're going to create a file. I'm going to say cat dev zero into file name. Okay. And it's an unending thing. So I'm going to hit control C to stop because it basically, like I said, it's a fire hose because it's a character device and it's just shooting that null character over and over forever and ever and ever and ever. It's a never ending fount of a null character uh, when you query it. And if we look LS minus L, it just in that amount of time uh, that I was talking before I hit control C, it looks like we got, let's see, that's 1.5 gigabytes, I think. Yeah, 1.5 gigabytes of data dumped into file name, and it's all null characters, just one right after another. That's why it's pretty easy to zero out a hard drive using dev zero, because we just write all of those null characters over and over, and it's just a fire hose that shoots. But let's do this. Let's erase it. So rm file name. All right, so nothing there. Now, if we were to say cat dev null, oops, I got to spell it right, into file name. All of a sudden, nothing comes out of it. It immediately gives me back the command line. And if we do ls minus l, we're going to see zero file length, right? Because remember, nothing ever comes out of dev null. It's, it's just a, a black hole or a bit bucket. And so data goes in, data never comes out. So that's the difference between them. And there is one more specific character device that is mentioned. And I'm going to talk about two. Now, the other character device mentioned in the objectives is dev u, the letter u, random. So dev u random. And the other one I want to talk about is dev random because you'll see them both in there and they're close to the same, but slightly different. And basically what they do is they will give you a fire hose stream of random characters. Now they're not always characters that you can display on the screen. They're not just ASCII characters. They're just a stream of randomness. Basically the difference is dev random, which is older, uh, will not return any information until there's enough entropy built up in the system. Now this gets into weird cryptology, random theory stuff, but basically let's say that you had a virtual machine in a saved state. When you restored that, it would be the exact same, no matter who restored it. Like you give somebody a save state, they restore it. If they were to get stuff from dev random, it would be exactly the same as the other person who had just started it the randomness would be based on the state of the machine. And so as a computer runs and different things happen and you type stuff and electricity happens, all sorts of stuff, it builds up what's called entropy, which is just random 
randomness in the system. And so dev random will not return anything until it determines enough entropy has built up in the system. And that means that if you're writing a program that queries dev random for information, it could lock things while it's waiting for enough entropy to build up. And that would be really bad if you're running a program that has to quickly get a random number. And it's just like, oh, we're gonna wait, do nothing until we get enough entropy built up in the system. And so that's where dev u random comes into play. It will always return randomness. Whether there's a ton of entr entropy built up or not, it will always return randomness. And to be quite honest, unless we're talking about public and private key pairs and, and cryptography and all that kind of stuff, you're gonna have plenty of randomness from dev u random. It's, it's fine if you're just looking for a random way to randomize something in your program, dev u random is what you want and that's why it's mentioned in the objectives and to be honest if you're writing scripts and stuff it's not terribly useful dev u random like i said it's a fire hose string of random characters but not usable characters generally you just want like a a random a number or something, right? Well, thankfully, uh, the, the command line, like bash specifically, has an environment variable all set up for you. So you don't have to actually figure out a way to get randomness from the dev u random device, which, I mean, we can look in there, dev uh, or ls minus l, dev, and we'll grep for random. And we'll see both of them, random and u random, both character devices. Rather than trying to get information out of there into a usable form, you can just use the random uh, environment variable included in recent versions of Bash. So if we were to just do echo random, we're going to get a random 32-bit number, okay? And it uses the internal entropy of the system to convert it to a number, but this will just give you a 32-bit random number every time you query it, which is usually all you'll need if you're writing a script. So that's not actually in the, the exam objectives, but if you want to use this on a practical level, that's usually something you can quickly grab randomness from, just the random environment variable, and you'll get a random 32-bit integer. The other thing I want to look at in this video is the actual devices on your system. So you can look and see what physical devices you have on your system. And it's a lot more interesting if we go to a, a bare metal install because a lot of virtualized hardware is kind of generic and lame to look at. So I'm going to SSH into one of my bare metal servers uh, on my personal network and we'll just look at some of the tools there to see the actual hardware installed. So I just SSH'd into my local box. It's called Pookie uh, from the Garfield uh, comic. Obviously, I'm a Garfield fan if you've seen my office. And the first tool, notice I'm root. Some of these you need to be root to get the, the information out of. So I just I became root. And the first is LSPCI, which will show you a list, LS, of PCI devices on your system. And it will give you all of the PCI devices, even if they're integrated onto the motherboard. These are just all of the PCI devices that are on the system. Like I said, these could be on the board. These could be add-on cards. Uh, if you want to look for something specific, like let's clear the screen. Uh, I'll do LSPCI and let's grep dash I so it ignores case and we're going to search for network. I don't know if network is capitalized or not. So that's why we're just doing it with the dash I. So we'll grep for network and we'll see uh, this has uh, two Ethernet controllers. Looks like it's a dual Ethernet ports and they are Intel gigabit network ports uh, and there are two of them. So this is a way that you can look at PCI devices on your computer. There's another one very similar LS. USB and it will show you the USB devices. Obviously there are far fewer USB devices, even though some of these are still on the motherboard. Uh, these, there are fewer devices here and let's see if we can pick something out. Uh, so I have, um, this, this server that is in my basement does not have built-in Bluetooth. So I have a little Bluetooth USB dongle that I plug into it. And that's how I query my radon detector in the basement. But anyway, so it shows up as a USB device because it is a Bluetooth USB adapter. So that's shown right there. Uh, this hub that's just built into the motherboard, uh, root hub built into the motherboard. Um, Windbond, Herma, I think this must be something built onto the motherboard too. The only thing I have plugged into it is that, that, uh, Bluetooth chip, but these are all the USB devices and you'll be able to see them, uh, regardless of what you have plugged into your system. They will show all the USB devices. And then the last one I want to look at is called DMI decode and DMI decode. I'm going to show you a slide real quick. 
So DMID code has a bunch of things it'll show you. It will basically, if you've ever used something like Ansible, where it queries the system for like everything there could possibly be about the system, that's a little bit like what DMID code does. It just shows you everything, but you can narrow it down based on topic. And here's just a list of the topics. So for example, if you want to see as much information as you can about uh, the particular uh, BIOS of the system or uh, the CPU or the memory in particular, you can narrow it down by topic and it will show you just that topic or just the information related to that topic. I'll show you really quick. Um, I mean, this is just the more uh, information gathering than anything else, but this is the one you have to be root to use. So DMI decode. And if we just press it, it's going to show us everything. And I know you didn't see how fast that went, but uh, I mean, I can scroll forever. All of the information is dumped if you don't specify. Um, and actually that's as far up as my terminal buffer went, but it will just dump all of the information it knows right onto the screen. And so let's clear this and we're going to use DMI decode dash T and let's just look at processor information. Did I spell processor right? Processor? Yeah. Okay. And this will give us information about the processor. Uh, for example, this is a, an Intel Xeon processor. And this is why I wanted to use the bare metal server instead of a VM because a VM doesn't show you as interesting of information. Uh, but this is the actual CPU in this server in my basement. Um, it looks like it's three gigahertz. Um, and there's interesting, it's, it's older uh, based on the, it's an X, 3470 so it's not a super big one um let's clear the screen because there's interesting stuff about dmi decode dash t i'm going to go memory here and i'm going to pipe it through more so we can look page at a time and let's see so this has six memory slots we can see it, it talks about the stuff the maximum memory module size is only four gigabytes that means I can only put four gigabyte memory chips into each slot on the motherboard. This is an older server, obviously, right? I mean, pretty old. Four gigabytes is not big for a memory chip anymore. Uh, but that's the maximum size chip I can put in, which means the total maximum memory size is going to be 24 gigabytes because there are six memory slots. And so this is the kind of information you can get using DMI decode, and it will tell us about each uh, RAM slot in the system. So uh, let's see uh, this one. Let's see. There's a four gigabyte SIM in there. Awesome. Uh, this one has another four gigabyte SIM. Let's see this one uh, not installed. This one has a four gigabyte SIM. Uh, this one has a four gigabyte SIM and this one is not installed. So it looks like I have four chips in there and they're four gigabyte, the max size they can be. So I'm going to hit Q. And using our math skills, let's see if we can figure out how many gigs of RAM this server has. Well, if there were four that were populated with four megabyte chips, there should be 16 gigs in the server. So let's see, free dash H. And sure enough, 15 gigs, it rounds down because of megabytes and, and, and bytes, etc. But yeah, that's how much is available in the system. And that's really it. That's where devices are stored on the system. You know the difference between character devices and block devices. Uh, you learn some extra stuff like the random environment variable. And look and see if you can identify the hardware in your system using LSPCI, LSUSB, DMI decode, and all that stuff. It's just kind of cool to get a feel for how you can investigate what a computer is using command line tools it will tell you about itself anyway that's it for this video i hope look forward to seeing you on the next one um and we're just about done with this section i think next time we're going to talk about compiling our own software and a couple other things but anyway i'll see you next time take it easy